Thank you for your patience. Sorry about that. Thank you too. All right. Um, so we, our goal um, obviously is to um, give you kind of an overview of the trail. Um, talk about you know how we approached it. Everyone does a through hike very differently, um, and uh, we'll do our best to stay within our time frame because I think we could talk for hours about this. So, um, Mark, I know you're facilitating the meeting, but just time. Thank you so much, Mark. So, um, so we started um, Appalachian Trail last year on February 26th, and we finished um, in 167 days on August 11th. And Eric and I are gonna kind of go back and forth um, and uh, take turns talking about the trail. All right, oops, let me go back one, sorry, Eric. So uh, first off, what is the Appalachian Trail? It was a footpath developed or envisioned by Benton McKay back in 1921. And he uh, thought of it as potentially even an economic Linked to the small towns throughout the east coast of the Ap and the, or the Appalachians, um, they, there were already some trails uh, in New England, specifically the Vermont Long Trail that goes from south to north, uh, the length of Vermont, and they incorporated some of these previous trails. But then, um, over about a decade, we're able to connect all the way the south into Georgia. Uh, basically, the, the land that was available was the peaks of the mountain because they couldn't farm it or, or forest it. So uh, it kind of goes from peak to peak uh, from Georgia up into Maine. And so you'll see um, 1921, we were hiking at the 100th anniversary of the oh, Appalachian yeah. Trail. Um, and so a lot of you might have read or seen the movie uh, Walk in the Woods with Bill Bryson. And we, of course, have um, read and watched both. And we would joke about Bill Bryson throughout the trail. Um, it's not a walk in the woods. You know, we are um, avid hikers and walkers in Michigan. And, uh, you know, kind of the joke on the trail was that uh, Bette McKay literally took a um, string and strung it around every single major peak from uh, Georgia to Maine to make the trail <laughs> for no apparent, it wasn't the easiest way. It just was uh, what he felt was gonna be the trail. So the question we often get um, is why did we hike and how do we prepare? Um, essentially, it kind of became a dream of mine. A friend of mine um, worked at the library and she had called me and said, hey, Shelly, um, we have an author coming that I think you would like. And Jennifer Farr Davis, who wrote Becoming Odessa, came to the library in 2010. And I went down on a Sunday afternoon and um, I was one of only a handful of people there and just was blown away by her story. She, in her early 20s, hiked the entire Appalachian Trail in like 54 days, averaging something like 37 miles a day. Um, Uh-oh, we have no, you can't hear us again? No, I can hear you. Okay, I just saw a chat. Okay, okay, I'm glad that everyone can hear us. So um, so that kind of lit a fire, meeting Jennifer Farr Davis and reading her book lit this fire. And I literally came home um, and ordered a map of the trail and it hung next to our bed. It's still there next to our cross um, for 10 years. And we spent time um, in the summer, we'd hike, you know, every couple of years we go and hike a section of it. And uh, we hiked in Michigan and we talked about it. We just continue to talk about it. And Eric kind of was like, this is Shelly's dream. <laughs> Shelly's dream to do this. And I dreamt about doing it alone. And I dreamt about doing it with some of my girlfriends. And eventually Eric came on board and um, decided to hike it with me. So for us, it was really a decompressing after retirement. Um, we both had big careers. So one of the things that we did that I think is important to recognize, you'll see that picture in the corner. Um, you'll see us off to the right. And then there's this gentleman that looks like Santa Claus with a blue shirt. Um, that is Warren Doyle. And Warren Doyle is actually a legend on the Appalachian Trail. He has hiked um, the trail something like 18 times. And um, he also is guided. He does things called the smart hikes and he'll guide groups through sections of the trail. He also holds something called the Appalachian Trail Institute. 
And so we um, decided to participate in that. And that really was what launched um, the through hike. Before that, we just couldn't wrap our head around it. How can you be gone for six months? How do you get your supplies? What kind of gear do you need? How much does this cost? You know, how do you eat? How do you drink? How, you know, all those things were swirling in our head. And we spent um, two weeks with Warren and then hiked um, down in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. And that really kind of solidified the fact that we could do the trail. We had a plan, we could, we knew how to divide it up, what it looked like. And um, we did that in October um, prior to our February launch on the trail. So it really took us about 10 years um, of dreaming, but about five or six months before really intense planning yes. to start the trail. So uh, the journey starts at Amicola Falls, um, in Georgia, you're uh, about an hour north of Atlanta. Uh, and there's an eight miles, it's an approach trail to Springer Mountain, which is the official start point. Uh, we hike, you, there, traditionally you try to hike 15 miles a day and you finish in about five months. Uh, we were able to do it in 167 days or five and a half months with 10 zero days. Uh, meaning 10 days that we didn't hike, partly COVID, partly because uh, Shelly got her COVID shots uh, on the trail, need to rest, and I broke my toe and we had to take a day for that. And um, um, we, the, then... Um, yeah. Um, and so for, for me anyway, it was kind of like adult summer camp. You um, get to hike every day, hang out with fun people and do things you'd never tell your mother when you got home. Uh, everybody has a, a trail name. I'm not sure exactly why. I think just to be fun and uh, make it a little bit anonymous. And so I was known as Gra Grasshopper and Shelly was known as Meta. And so you'll see, I listed a few other um, hiker names there at the bottom. One of the guys we hiked with for a long time, his name was Baked Potato, and he had synonyms with it. So he was, at the end of the day, a mashed potato, or the girls would call him sweet potato, or if he ever has kids, he'll call him tater tot. So everyone had names. Um, but the one I want to talk about just for a second was um, God's Water. And, you know, you kind of met all these different people on the trail and um, somewhere in like uh, New Jersey, we stumble upon this, this kid who, who befriends us and is, he's from um, Las Vegas, his dad's in prison. Um, and it turns out before he met us, um, he got his trail name because he'd never been on the trail. This was just something he felt like he needed to do. And the first time he sees water coming out of the side of a mountain, he turns to the people that are with him and he says, man, this must be God's water because he'd never seen anything like that. And so that's how he got his name. So names often come from things that, um, you know, that happen on the trail. Uh, logistically, you have to have a support team. And so we were fortunate to have family and friends that, kind of helped us out, you know, going through the mail and the bills and taking care of the yard. Uh, one of our Shelly's friend even planted flowers. Somebody take care of the dog. And uh, uh, one of our friends, uh, Leslie Dort, was sending us our supply packages we'd set up before. And then, of course, prayers, texts, and messages of support yeah. to keep us going. We really couldn't have done it without the team of people that were cheering us on um, from the side. So let's talk about the trail a little bit. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, one of our fears was getting lost. Um, but we navigated the trail really well because it's, it's actually really well marked. Um, there's a series of blazes that are two by six, which is kind of the size of a, a dollar bill that mark the trail. The trail is marked um, essentially from north uh, to south and then from south to north. So you have hikers going each direction. So one of the things that's interesting about it is if there's ever a point in the trail where you feel like you don't know where you are, um, the first thing you do is turn around to see if you can see a blaze behind you. 
And as you can see from the pictures there, um, a lot of where you hike, you know, it's a hundred year old trail is very worn. And there are times that we were hiking and we could hike for almost the whole morning and never even realized that we were looking at blazes. You kind of just knew you were on the trail. Um, and part of it is it became very automatic as well. Um, you'll also see how there's um, single blazes, which just means the path goes, but if the blaze on the top is offset to the right, it means you the trail veers to the right. If it's offset to the left, it means it veers to the left. And then as you see on that sign, if there's two white blazes on top of each other, what it means is that the trail crosses something. So a stream or a road or another trail and you stay straight. So it was really, really well marked, except for New Hampshire. And we'll talk about New Hampshire later. <laughs> there are also uh, different signs along the way that uh, let you know where the trail was. You cross lots of um, roads as well. And these are some of the road signs that are there. And then um, there are no official mileage signs, but people would make signs of, to delineate how far along the trail you were. And, and they were really psychologically important because the first hundred miles are really difficult. You're, you're learning how to pace yourself and hike. And, uh, but it, it's interesting once you go get to a quarter of the trail or then even to a half, you know, it's like, wow, I can do this. And, and in fact, by the time you get to the, uh, halfway point, uh, it's pretty much a mind game, barring any injury, it's a mind game to finish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So camp life, um, we um, camped 90% of the time on the trail. Um, occasionally we'd get off, uh, go to a shower, hotel, hostel, but these are just some pictures. Um, you can see us snuggled in, in the middle, um, in a shelter, um, clothes hanging to dry, and off to the right, you always had to hang your food. And this is an example of um, bear hangs um, in a tree. And then um, you're a la nature, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but uh, they, they did have privies uh, associated with uh, the shelters, which are every 20 miles or so. And it was nice to have those. Of interest on the left is one in the Smoky Mountains, and because it's a national park, uh, the handicap uh, uh, accessibility is required. So there were grab bars in that uh, privy. <laughs> I'm going to just uh, page back because I, I thought I missed one. Um, so I'm going to jump back. So as I started to say before, um, we stayed in shelters occasionally, but we stayed in a tent most of the time. Um, these are shelters that are along the trail. They're approximately every 20 to 30 miles. Um, and what it does is it helps to provide a place if it's raining, um, windy, that you can get out. Um, the one in the middle where you see Grasshopper um, is actually one of the last shelters coming out of the Smokies. It has the um, fence in it. And um, at one point in the Smokies, all of the shelters had those so that you would be protected from bear. Um, what's interesting about that one is we stayed there um, that night um, and it was early March when we were there, but later this shelter, which is Cosby Shelter, was the site of a bear attack this summer um, of a young girl who was in a hammock, had no food on her, but she was attacked by a bear and thankfully survived. Um, so in the Smokies, one of the things we had to do is we had to stay in the shelters because of the danger. Um, on the bottom left, you'll see Grasshopper and the girls we started the trail with. That was actually our first day on the trail. Um, and it was raining and we were just taking a rest at lunch. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of what the shelters look like. And some are very rustic and some are a little nicer. Um, it just depends on the state and also the trail club that's managing that. So we did camp life, right? We did privies, okay. Um, gear. Yeah, um, the gear, uh, we started in the winter, so we um, were a little heavier, like a three season tent. Um, and uh, um, 
extra clothing and sleeping bags and went mm -hmm. down to 20 degrees. Um, uh, you can see uh, the pack that we were using there uh, on the left is it's a gossamer is the make of it. And it's just over about two pounds for the pack. But then with all the supplies uh, accepting, and there was the base pack accepting food and water. In the winter, we were about 25 pounds. By the summer months, we could cut it back to about 15 pounds because we got a lighter tent, lighter sleeping bags and less clothes. Um, and then you'd add in your, your food and water, which would be about another 10 pounds. So in the winter, we were at about 35 pounds. In the summer, uh, about 25 pounds if you included food and water. And because your, um, your water sources can potentially be contaminated specifically with Giardia, which is a parasite you know, from the wild animals, um, you, you would filter the water. So um, you can see in the middle slide, uh, everybody would carry a smart water bottle simply because it was light and easy available. And then the bag at the bottom of it, you can see the little uh, brown cylinder with a white cap. That's a um, Sawyer water filter. And so uh, in that bag, there's also a blue bag that you would gather your water, run it through the filter into your smart water bottle um, to keep your water supply. And then uh, on the right, uh, on the top is a picture of our tent. Uh, on, the bo on the bottom were the hiking poles we were carrying. So hiking on the Appalachian Trail for me um, was a feat because I um, am bone on bone in both of my knees. Um, and so thankfully I had a resident orthopedic surgeon with me, but um, I had to hike um, with both poles. I'd never hiked with poles because I've hiked in Michigan and um, those poles literally saved my knees uh, along yeah. with my husband, obviously. Um, so a little bit more about gear. Um, essentially, we had sleep clothes, um, we had hiking clothes, and we had rain and, and heavy winter clothes. Um, we kind of carried heavy um, in one department. A lot of hikers, um, and this is the reality of the trail, um, either hike with no underwear or one or maybe two pairs of underwear. Um, we ended up hiking with five pairs of underwear. So that was a little bit of a luxury. And we hiked with extra socks. Um, we knew kids that hiked with one pair of socks. And there was a point on the trail when they were showing Eric their feet. And it looked like trench foot. Um, so we, we tried to keep, uh, you know, our clothes as clean as we could. And especially our socks and our underwear. Um, in the middle, um, we had rain jackets, um, there's hat gloves there, everything's in Ziplocs because everything gets wet um, if you're not wearing it, um, trying to keep things as dry as possible. And then on the right, you can see a little bit of our, our supplies for our food. Um, that's actually what we carried the first eight days on the trail. And um, what's uh, fun about it is that we actually carry too much. When you start the trail, you're worried about having enough food. Um, and truthfully, you're, we're so tired and you're working so hard that you just can't eat. We actually had a hard time eating. That actually lasted us like two weeks. By the end of the trail, it's totally different. Um, but at the beginning, it takes uh, a while to get used to get your hiker hunger, as they say. And then um, one segment of the gear we were carrying would be the electronics, specifically, uh, traditionally, you would use maps, you know, hard copy maps to, to navigate. And then eventually they, they developed some pretty sophisticated booklets, you know, showing uh, small sections of the trio with all the water supply and things like that. But then starting about six, seven years ago, uh, it, first it was called gut hooks and they just changed your name to far out. So you can kind of see in the center there, the, the, um, app that you can actually put on your cell phone. And what's nice about it, once you download it on your phone, you can put your phone on an airplane mode to save power, uh, but your GPS and your phone is still working and will na navigate you with this um, far out app, uh, both uh, as, as a map, but also as an a, a outline of the elevation that you're gonna do during the day. Um, 
And then on the left is the what's called the Garmin uh, Mini InReach. And it's basically, if you didn't have cell service and you were had a fall or badly hurt, uh, this will use the satellite to um, communications so that you could call for help. Um, I didn't want to carry it. I thought it was a little heavy at about two and a half ounces, but uh, <laughs> Shelly felt better having the security of that. And then on the right slide, um, we did take a luxury item. We took a, a mini Kindle and downloaded literally a dozen books. And, and we had a pair of earbuds we shared that we could listen to books at night uh, along the trail. So one of the things about the um, books that I want to mention is we were recommended um, a book called um, Secret Life of Trees. And a lot of through hikers listen to that book because you're walking among the trees. Um, and we actually listened to it twice. Um, we listened to it at night as we're in our tents. And then during the day, we would talk about it. Um, what's interesting is a lot of kids would um, on the trail would plug in and listen to music or books as they hiked. But Eric and I actually um, never did. We only listened to it at night. Um, when we hiked, we just listened to the wind and the, the trees and the leaves and nature and things like that. Um, here's our tent. Off to the um, left, you'll see a big yellow REI tent. That was our um, Hilton, as we called it. It's the tent we started with. It was a three season tent and it weighed about six pounds. Um, it kept us nice and warm and dry in the Smokies when it was snowing, um, but we knew we had to get rid of it um, to save weight and as the weather warmed. And so you'll see us on the bottom lane, actually in Hot Springs in an outfitter store, buying a new um, Tiger Wall. Um, Big Agnes. Big Agnes, thank you. Big Agnes Tiger Wall. Um, that was only two pounds. So we saved four pounds once we switched out from the three season tent to our summer tent. And then uh, here's a picture that Amicola Falls uh, the arch that you started at on the left. And um, they give you a number that you start, we were 273 and 274 uh, to start the trail that year. And then on the right, um, is the sign at Mount Katahdin when you finish and uh, everybody has to get their picture on the sign. Uh, we, we were going to put both hands up, but it was really windy and we were afraid we were going to get blown off. Um, and you can kind of see the transformation a little bit. You can see um, how much weight we lost. Um, you know, we, we look a little more veteran by the end. We look a little <laughs> baby faced at the beginning, um, but you can see we finished in the 300s um, on the way. Um, to finishing. So let's talk about some interesting facts. And then in a second, we're going to get into kind of um, each state. But some facts about the trail. Um, Trek.com uh, is a great source. And this is where this comes from. Um, somebody did a study and the, the hiking the entire Appalachian Trail is the equivalent of summiting Mount Everest 16 times. And every time I read that, I have to stop for a second and, and my knees hurt <laughs> thinking about that. And you can see the ele elevation gains and losses. I mean, it's just huge, 464,000. It takes the average hiker 165 days to complete and you wear through about four to five pairs of shoes. And we did exactly that. Um, you have to consume 5,500 calories to maintain your weight. And most people lose about 30 pounds. And we did just about that. Unfortunately, some of that weight's come back on <laughs> since we have a reliable food source here. Um, but I think for us, the bigger thing is that, you know, every year approximately 3,500 people attempt a through hike. And a through hike as recognized by the ATC or the Appalachian Trail Conservancy is that you finish it in one calendar year. And only a fourth of those who start actually finish. And actually of those that um, finish, very few do it as a couple and very few do it at age 63 or 62 and age 50. Um, so we feel you know, pretty proud of the fact that um, we're one of only about 14 to 15,000 people who have ever completed the entire um, trail in a calendar year. So I um, wanted to go through each of the states. There are 14 states. You start in Georgia. It's not real long, 78 
and a half miles. Uh, but they, 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 there's quite a bit of elevation, as you can see, the highest point, Blood Mountains, 4,458 feet. Uh, so there is a lot of climbing. And in the south, it's about, it, it's 50% up, 50% down. When you get a little more to the middle states, it's kind of third up, third down, third level. Um, the, the other thing, since it's winter, there, there are no leaves in the trees, uh, but that gives you some beautiful mountain mm -hmm. vistas. Uh, in, because there aren't all the leaves. So you'll also notice the fog. Um, there was, it really rained like the first five days that we hiked, um, which is a good testament because we experienced a lot of rain on the trail, as you'll find out. Um, so then once you leave Georgia, you go into North Carolina and Tennessee and the trail kind of bounces back and forth. Some, you didn't know most days what, what state you were in. You're kind of in between the two. Um, Clingman's Dome in the Smoky Mountains is the highest. Um, you can see kind of the roundabout that's there. But the trail in the Smokies, the other two pictures are from the Smokies, was absolutely glorious. Um, what's interesting about the Smokies is that if you know anything about it, it can be very dangerous. And one of my fears going into the trail was we were going to hit the Smokies around March 4th or 5th. And um, we literally got into the Smokies on the first day and we received a text from the ATC indicating that we should get off the trail, but there were storms coming. And at that point, we'd already gone in, we'd gone up to like 4,000 feet and we were at the first campsite and we decided to stay in. And thankfully we were safe, um, but the wind howled and it rained and then it snowed and it rained and it snowed essentially the whole time we were in um, the Smokies. But Ultimately, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> and um, truthfully, you know, once we got past the Smokies, the weather started to change um, and it just really became a beautiful time to hike. And then Virginia, West Virginia, uh, as you can see, the mileage is 540 miles, which basically is a quarter of the entire trail. Uh, we're, we're in, uh, we were getting into Virginia towards the end of March. Uh, so you can see spring was following us and the mm -hmm. leaves are starting to come out just beautiful um, to see the spring and the beautiful wildflowers uh, um, you know to have spring following us um, and i just want to point out um, in the middle you'll see the sign that says hiker warning entering the roller coaster so on the trail there's all sorts of different little fun features, I mean fun in the terms of hiking fun, but essentially it's a it's a period of something like um, 80 miles that literally go up and down, up and down like a roller coaster. And it was brutal, but it was really pretty because of the time of the year that we're there. And you can see how, you know, spring had really finally sprung. So one of the things that the trail does, you know, Eric had that analogy of summer camp and there are all these traditions and, um, one of them is then when you got to the halfway point um, that um, you would um, get your picture taken at the ATC center like we did there, but you would also um, do a half gallon challenge, a half gallon of ice cream and try to eat it as quickly as you could. And so those are the group of kids we were hiking with, reset with his hands up and baked potato and then Eric and then myself um, trying to eat at nine o'clock in the morning, a half gallon of ice cream. I was not successful. It was the first thing that hit my belly in the morning. I couldn't do it. Um, I'd stopped basically when I um, took that picture, but Eric, uh, he managed to do it in about 30 minutes, right? Yep, and the kids, they can do it in 15 minutes, but at my age, I was afraid that a brain freeze could be fatal. <laughs> So, um, oh, Maryland. <laughs> yeah, Maryland's kind of a short state, but uh, again, a real pretty state. Uh, and you know, we were hitting it in the spring. Um, uh, and, and you can see on the left, you know, you get to the Mason Dixon line and you're basically halfway. You know, what was nice about once you got into the middle states, they went fast. I mean, we were hiking about 15 miles a day. So basically we came into Maryland, spent one night and came out of Maryland, you know, yeah. so it's a quick, quick trip, which was kind of fun to start checking off the miles. 
So, okay, so Pennsylvania <laughs> is where life got real. <laughs> um, you can see just by the pictures. Um, some people call it Roxylvania because there's so many rocks and rocks of every size. Um, the one on the left, um, we're coming out of Lehigh Gap um, and you'll see another picture of Lehigh Gap later, but essentially it's just a pile of rocks that you come out of. Um, the other one to the right is called the knife's edge and eventually it straightens out into what looks like the side of a knife and you're just basically balancing on the top of a rock pile. Um, but tons of rocks, you feel everything, you wear through your shoes and uh, when Pennsylvania is done, you're happy to go into our second, uh, or into New Jersey, sorry. Yeah, New Jersey, I always thought of as a you know, very populous uh, state, and I didn't think there'd be, you know, much there, but you're going on the northwest corner of the state, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful, uh, beautiful hills, and, um, uh, and to interject too, I, I have one of these Garmin watches that in the south, we were doing about 4,000 foot of elevation a day and you'd burn about 4,000 calories. And these middle states was a little less, like 3,000 to 3,500 elevation a day and your calorie count would go down a little bit there. And then by the time you got to Western Massachusetts, you're back up to the 4,000 elevation calories a day. So what's amazing about New Jersey and New York is that you're more likely to see a bear in these two states than any place else on the trail, which we didn't realize. Um, we did see um, two sets of bears. We saw one um, coming in out of Virginia um, and then one in Shenandoah. Um, but um, this is New York. Um, New York is known for something called deli blazing. Um, we carried light food in New York because you cross so many roads and typically there were signs that would say gas station half a mile. So we would make that right and we'd go get some food. And so every time we crossed the road, if we could get food, that's what we did. <laughs> so New York was fun. We felt like we um, actually were stabilizing our weight at that point because we had lost so much weight. Um, so, you know, we would stop and, you know, eat as much as we could and take some with us and get back on the trail. Then Connecticut um, is a, a real nice uh, uh, hike too. It's um, a little flatter. And so you can sort of see on the right, you know, there's a boardwalk because there were some swampy areas and they're trying to protect the vegetation. Um, uh, and, and again, not as much elevation as you would have had in the south or in the north. So then Massachusetts, um, the trail actually starts to get a little more difficult as you get into Massachusetts. The middle states, I would say, were the easiest. Um, it starts hard and then it gets a little easier and then it starts to build up here as you're leaving Massachusetts. Um, picture of me, I'm in the CCC shelter at the lodge at top of Mount Greylock and kind of pointing out that we have something like 600 miles left um, to Mount Katahdin. Um, but it's really just, Massachusetts was absolutely beautiful, um, real picturesque. You know, we were there um, and it was really kind of like late May, early June, and it was just, just beautiful. Yeah, and then Vermont uh, is probably second to Virginia was our most uh, favorite state, just really beautiful vistas and um, a fun place to hike. Uh, uh, you, you, there's a long trail, like I say, that goes south to north and the Appalachian Trail shares that. And then at about halfway up the uh, state, you take a right and go on into New Hampshire. So New Hampshire, oh, I have to pause for a second. <laughs> New Hampshire is where the trail changed for me. Um, if anyone has hiked in New Hampshire, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, New Hampshire is um, has a range of mountains called the Presidential Range and or the Whites, and it is um, brutal. It's 4,000 foot peaks day after day, multiples of them. And you also have the highest uh, mountain range here, uh, Mount Washington. And you'll see the sign in the middle there that says stop. 
Um, essentially, it's warning you that this is very dangerous weather conditions. In fact, I encourage you to Google it because you'll see um, basically uh, stories of through hikers who have died there um, because it can change in a dime. Um, so when we were summiting Mount Washington, we left super early in the morning and um, we knew there was a storm coming and essentially you're above ridgeline for something like 16 miles. And so we were trying to get through that. And unfortunately, um, it was brutal. The wind, you could barely hold on. You could see in front of us. Um, it was impossible. Um, we ended up having to sideline and, and get off for a day um, and come back and finish it later because it was so brutal. Um, the other thing about New Hampshire is that it rained. We were there in July, late June, early July, and it actually was this year the wettest on history. And so it rained every single day we were in New Hampshire. And so not only are you climbing mountains, but you're descending on rocks and it was brutal. And that was the first time for me on the trail that I actually said, I'm done, I quit. And I think I quit every day. <laughs> but the problem is if you quit, um, you have to keep hiking. So um, obviously I didn't really quit. It just was how um, difficult it was in New Hampshire. And then on the right slide, you can see how the trail, they've kind of marked it out a little bit more with the rocks. And part of that's because you're in an alpine environment and the plant life grows very slowly and they're trying to protect it. Uh, so they really want you to stay on that path. Uh, Maine. Uh, uh, I love Maine. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's beautiful. Maine is basically northern Michigan with mountains. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, both New Hampshire and Maine, you know, lots of more technical, like rock scrambling, you know, climbing, uh, lots of roots, you know, very rough trail. Uh, but, but again, both areas, beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and then uh, the lower right, you can see the canoe. Uh, that's the Kennebunk uh, River, which it looks pretty placid, but it, it can, they can get like little flash floods. It can be dangerous. A couple people drown there. So now the official trail is, um, there's a, uh, a group that will ferry you across in a canoe and they literally have the AT sign in the um, bottom the of the canoe, canoe <laughs> because it's part of the official trail. We also, one of the things they say is, um, you're going to get your feet wet in Maine, and we did. Um, you end up fording a number of rivers yeah. in Maine as well. Um, everyone on the trail loved Maine, um, and we did too. But we would look around and we'd say, just come to northern Michigan. This is, without the mountains, this is, <laughs> Maine is northern Michigan. So here's our summit um, picture. So we, uh, we were gunning to summit on my 50th birthday, which was August 9th, and we were two days shy. So we summited on August 11th, but considering we hiked 167 days, it's pretty darn good. We came close, um, but we essentially, um, you have to camp um, at Katahdin Stream Campground, which is at the base of Mount Katahdin. And they basically give you a window to summit um, because you have to go up and you have to come back down. And it's very technical. And essentially um, they want you to do it within a certain window. In fact, they allow you to only start within a certain time frame. Like if you don't get up onto the mountain by and it depends on the time of the year that you're doing it. But for us, if you had to be on the mountain by eight o'clock, and so we actually left at four in the morning to summit um, with the group we were with. Part of it is we wanted to get up there early, kind of beat a storm that was coming in. And so um, you, we hiked up and um, get to the top of the mountain. And as you can see, it was just socked in with fog. Um, it was cold and blustery, but you know what? The fact is that we, um, we did it and we did it together. And that's, that's kind of the blessing of, um, of, of the journey is the fact that, you know, this was my dream, it became Eric's dream, it became our dream. And um, we're pretty proud of the fact that we did it. Um, and then you'll see really to the right, that's a picture I took on our GPS, the gut hooks are far out. Um, that's how we would see it. Um, you know, as we were hiking along, you could see the elevation. And so I took that at Throw Springs there right before we summited, just as a last little before we go off the cliff there. <laughs> But it was a pretty amazing day. 
And then uh, these are some of our hiking friends, uh, their pictures as they finished and uh, um, uh, you can see, yeah, days similar to us and days that were different, but yeah, we all finished at different times. Um, so one of the things about the trail is there's all these cultural aspects and there's something called trail magic. So essentially what will happen is on the trail, um, there are trail angels who provide food, drink, rides, company, help in, in so many different ways. And so the far um, left, the uh, uh, mother and son, they were former through hikers who'd done it last year and they set up at a road crossing and essentially you show up and the question becomes, are you a through hiker? You say yes. And they're like, come on in. What, what can we get you to eat? And so essentially they will feed you, they'll provide you uh, things, charge your phones, you can see the toilet paper or to grab a beer. Sometimes we'd find um, Gatorades floating in a river that someone had stocked there. So essentially it really was powerful to see the fact that people were willing to, to do that. Um, there is a picture there in the center. This is our first trail magic. It was a pancake with peanut butter, a hot dog and maple syrup. And they called it hiker trash. Now, I don't know that I'd eat that, but honestly it was having like a flame and young on the trail. It was so good. It really was. Our goal is to go back um, here in February and do a little bit of trail magic um, and help our fellow through hikers this year. And then, uh... If you needed to get into town, you'd hitchhike or some of the retired people would run a shuttle service and you could ride the back of a pickup truck to get into town to uh, get food. Uh, I'm not sure this is legal in, the, in, in Michigan. You know, the thing we joke about is we would say we're homeless with a credit card because you kind of are. You, you smell because you've not showered in, you know, five to seven days. Um, we hitchhiked. And now, you know, I don't know that I would be opposed to picking up hitchhikers after hitchhiking myself. Um, so off trail, um, you know, we stayed on trail as much as we could. But the reality is everyone tends to get off every five to seven days. You just can't carry that much food. And so you're due for a shower, you're due obviously to do laundry and resupply. So we stayed in um, hostels when we could, and these are some examples. I do wanna just point out um, the Octagon House. Uh, there's a picture below it. That's obviously Grasshopper and I, um, but this man, Ryan is a former through hiker, um, a, a retired Marine, I believe. Yep. Um, but what's interesting about Ryan is that's his hostel. We stayed with him for like three days. Um, he slack packed us, which means he took us up trail and we hiked with a day pack that gave our body some rest. But Ryan also um, has been on Naked and Afraid. If anyone's watched that, we had never. Um, we now have, and we've seen him. He was on like four or five episodes of it. And he was quite a character, but he loves through hikers because he was one himself and he likes to support them. So it was just a good fun find. Then, so let's see how we're going to talk about the elements on the trail. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It, it, it seemed to rain a lot. Uh, I, I would say at least a quarter, a third of the days. Um, I think it was partly because of all those fires in California and all the debris as it moves east, you know, precipitate a lot of rain. So uh, I have a rain jacket and then the rain skirt uh, to, to keep dry and, and they work. Mm -hmm. And then we had snow, <laughs> not as much as rain. I think it probably snowed a total of seven um, to eight days on the trail. I actually didn't mind the snow because it you kept a little drier. You were just cold and not sopping wet at the end of the day. And then uh, once spring comes and you, you, the leaves come out, they talk about the green tunnel. And so we just have a few pictures to um, illustrate that. And just it's it just a really beautiful uh, experience. So one of the things that I did was I took daily selfies um, and eventually I'm gonna to put together a video of all the daily selfies to kind of watch how we morph, you know, how the sun affects us and how the trail and you can see um, Grasshopper had never had a beard and he grew a beard on the trail. But um, we tended to hike early in the morning. Um, both pictures that are dark um, were morning hikes. We're hiking with headlights there and you can see Grasshopper kind of behind me. And then the other one is a, a morning hike as 
the sun was coming up. Some of the kids that we hiked with would hike late into the night, but we tended to get up early and hike, um, you know, 15 miles and then call it a day when we'd hit our mileage. And then uh, the waterfalls and the streams were real zen, uh, just really pretty. And a lot of times you're hiking along next to them, just a real treat. It was amazing how much water was plentiful on the trail. Yeah. So just some examples of the beautiful sunrises and sunsets that you would see on the trail. The, the first one is um, early on the trail because you can see that there's no vegetation. The other one um, with the two of us in it was taken, I think, in New York or New Jersey. The mushrooms and the plants uh, just fascinating. They're exotic. <laughs> I could literally do a whole slide show on all of the little plant life that we saw. Um, everything from the, I think it's called like an Indian pipe or a ghost pipe and some of the other mushrooms that we saw. So rocks, we devoted a whole slide to rocks because I could devote a whole hour to talking about rocks because we went over so many. But this picture of me is um, Lehigh Gap again, coming out of Pennsylvania. And it gives you some perspective where the road is down there to where we were. Um, sometimes they put rebar in as you see me climbing up. Um, and that kind of the perspective of climbing through rocks, over rocks, under rocks, all over. And then I call the one there my Outlander rock. Um, we saw a number of rock circles, um, like you'd see in the Outlander series. And so it was, I was always having fun with that as we passed them. Uh, and then in some areas, there are boardwalks, you know, where the, if, if it's a low marshy area or in some of those alpine areas, they're trying to protect the vegetation. And so the local or regional trail clubs would actually construct these uh, boardwalks, which are really nice. Uh, uh, most of them would be more like the middle pictures with yeah. just a, 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 a narrow board to walk on. And obviously a number of bridges, um, some very um, large, like you see on each side, but most of them tended to be like the one in the middle, just a log across the stream and you crossed. It just depended again on the size of the river or the trail club. And then uh, water on the, on the left is um, a, a beautiful lake in Maine, you know, it's very similar to Northern Michigan. Uh, in the middle, uh, some of the springs, the trail clubs had put a pipe to, to direct the water so you could fill your water bottles easily and protect the, the, the site. And then the right one, we were just trying to show you that blue bag you fill with the water before you actually filter it into your water bottle. Wildlife, um, saw a number of, of wildlife, as we said, <clears throat> two, two sets of bears. We actually saw two sets of moose up in Maine, but um, it all happened so quickly. We weren't able to get pictures, but these are some of the regular wildlife that we saw. The little orange guys were my favorites, um, kind of in the middle states, uh, New England, um, these little newts that we'd see um, all over the trail. Oh, then there's snakes. Uh, <laughs> and on the left, there, there are a fair number of rattlesnakes, especially in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And uh, I'm a bit hard of hearing. And so I almost stepped on one that was in the middle of the trail and kind of angry that it's a real high pitched sound they couldn't hear. So Shelly and one of the other hikers pushed me away. Uh, and then on the middle, um, I'm pretty sure that's a copperhead. And so I was afraid to step over. So we threw some little leaves and just light sticks at it to get it to move. And well, what you can't see here is um, that is a boardwalk and that's the trail. There's no place to go. That's Connecticut, I think. Yeah, and because it's swamp on each side. We literally stood there for 30 minutes throwing things at that snake so that we could pass because there was no place to go. We had to go through and eventually it moved off. And then on the right is a black snake, which is non-venomous and they're actually good in that they they apparently push away the, the venomous snakes, you know. Uh, um. I, I'm going to apologize, our dogs, uh, you might hear them in the background a little bit. Um, 
but um, just pictures of the beautiful flowers. I took, again, I could fill a whole slideshow of all the beautiful flowers, Mount Laurel and the uh, uh, trillium, trillium that we saw. But the Mount Laurel, they came out in bloom right when we went through New York, the middle states, it was spectacular. They were. So one of the things that happens on the trail is, um, it's like summer camp, as Eric said, you become fast friends um, with the people you hike with. And so they call it your tramily your trail family. And um, as you see, these are a lot of the people we hiked with. Um, actually, almost everyone made it with the exception of a few people. Um, so in the upper right, the two gentlemen, the blue shirt and the green shirt, um, or gray shirt, they did not make the trail, unfortunately. Then on the bottom, the gentleman in the red um, rain jacket, Orlando, Unfortunately, he ended up having a compound fracture on his leg and did not make the whole trail. And then finally, if you go up to the thousand mile mark, um, the gentleman in the um, stocking camp, the older gentleman did not um, finish the trail, but everyone else on this um, picture collage finished the trail and we hiked with for numerous miles and had a ton of fun um, with all of them. The young ladies that um, have the blueberries, we loved Maine because we would literally be picking blueberries and that they picked for my birthday and presented it to us as they found us on the trail and it was lovely that they'd done that. And we were lucky to have some friends and family come in and join us for parts of the hike. Um, um, notable in the center picture is uh, our nephew Ezra, better known as Mountain Goat, uh, in the rain jacket. Um, and then we also had um, uh, uh, Leslie Dort, uh, you can see in the upper right and the lower left. Came and twice. <laughs> came twice. And, uh, Tina Denblanker on the upper right, uh, and then Kelly Blue, uh, she met up with us in Franklin, North Carolina there in the middle right. Uh, she was um, attempting a through hike. She didn't quite make it last year, but I think was going to try again this year. And on the lower right is... Um, Shelby Sexton. Shelby, yeah. You guys might know her parents, her dad teaches at ACC, but yeah, we had a lot of support of people that came to visit us on the trail. So let's talk about food. <laughs> um, through hikers, uh, notoriously hungry eventually. So we um, did what a lot of through hikers did, a lot of things on tortillas. Tortillas are easy to carry. Um, so you'll see uh, our gourmet tuna fish with Chex Mix or peanut butter with coconut or dried fruit, or we would boil water and have dehydrated meals. But we only carried our, um, our stove. stove, thank you, for half the trail. Um, we found that it was just too much weight and we're using it once a day. So um, we actually sent it home at one point. Well, and then this is a typical re resupply list. Um, you try to get like dried fruits. Uh, if you get an apple, they were good. You want to eat them quickly because they're heavy. Cheese, you could take a um, like a hard cheddar would last three or four days in the tree. Um, lots of cliff bars uh, um, and chips. Uh, uh, and I always had to have a candy bar. Well, speaking of candy bars, um, so there was a point in the 100 mile wilderness, which is the last little bit of Maine, where we were consuming four candy bars a piece on top of our <laughs> normal meals. Um, there was a point I was actually keeping track of how many candy bars we were eating, but it, the number became too staggering and I couldn't continue to do the tallying marks. So they have lots of fun things on the trail. And so um, one of the things they do are the challenges. And so this is a challenge. Oh, uh, yeah, the, they, they had these gourmet milkshakes at this one hostel that I had four of. And uh, we were there about an hour and a half. Uh, I, I think if we were another hour, I could have beat the record of seven. I had two. Our friend Darity Das had three and Eric had four. <laughs> four milkshakes. <laughs> 
So one of the things that we encountered were controlled burns on the trail. In fact, we had to take a day off because they were doing a controlled burn in Southern Georgia. And it was really kind of apocalyptic in a sense when you come back out on the trail, as you can see, that what they had done is they burned the undergrowth to help prevent forest fires from later on. Um, we did actually come into the aftermath of a real forest fire um, someplace in, was it Virginia? Yes. Yeah, in Virgi Northern Virginia, that some um, hiker had accidentally set like three or four days before we went through. So one of the things that people ask us is, you know, what are your lessons um, from the Appalachian Trail? Um, and so, you know, uh, one of the things that we came down to was that Simplicity of life, simplicity offers a full life that oftentimes, like even as I'm sitting here in my beautiful home, um, we have so much stuff. And, you know, for six months, Eric and I literally lived with uh, about 20 pounds in our back with everything we needed. And that uh, oftentimes what happens with people who have through hiked is they come home and they purge. They get rid of all the, the strenuous things that are in your home that you don't need and they focus more on experience and so that's kind of what we're trying to do um the second thing is you know the media really presents the world in a kind of crazy fashion and makes you scared of people and um being on the trail reaffirmed our faith in people and the goodness of people and you know had you told me a year ago would you eat out of a guy's cooler in a parking lot i would have said no way but I will tell you, we ate in strangers, coolers and kitchens and took rides from people. And honestly, everyone, it, it was all really good. Um, so it just reaffirmed our faith in the goodness of people. Um, the third lesson that we have is kind of the beauty of nature that, you know, every part of the trail, even the rainy days, there was beauty in that. Because honestly, um, when it rained, there weren't day hikers. <laughs> so sometimes we would joke as through hikers that rainy days were some of the best days because we were the only ones on the trail and it was a little quieter. So kind of finding that beauty in all parts of nature. And then obviously the big one is the power of setting and carrying out a goal. Um, you know, we dreamed about this for 10 years and we took chunks of it um, in practice, but you know, we were intimidated even on day one. And the fact that together, we set a goal and we, we did it, but you do it in small chunks. You know, it never happens overnight. Um, you know, the idea that we started hiking and it was eight miles and eight miles was all we could do. And then we moved up to 10 miles and we moved up to 12 miles. And eventually I think our highest day was 23, 24, 24 miles in one day. And our average for the whole hike was 14.3 per day. Mm -hmm. So there's tons of lessons, but I think those are our big lessons learned. Yes. And the thing, you know, that we said all along is that, you know, we just felt blessed to be able to be out there, to be healthy enough, sure. have the finances to do it and have the support of the people um, at home. And our next adventure is <laughs> we want to hike down into the Grand Canyon and back up in late March. Uh, we want to finish hiking that long trail in Vermont in July with our nephew there, uh, Mountain Goat. And then in September, we're hoping to hike the uh, Camino de Santiago that runs across uh, northern Spain. You know, it's a traditional pilgrimage route. Mm -hmm. And then we'd like to do sections of the Pacific Crest Trail and the John Muir Trail that's a part of it apparently is real spectacular in California. But I'm saying dip our toes because <laughs> one of the things they talk about is that you carry your fears on the trail. So I carried heavy water because um, I was always fearful of not having water and um, PCT scares me because there's not water like there is on the Appalachian Trail. So we'll dip our toes there. So a couple other things, um, if you want more information, um, I did do a trail blog um, of the whole through hike that's the website. I do caution you if you look at it, um, don't judge me because I was doing it on my cell phone after a full day of hiking and it's not um, well written. It was more just a communication device with um, friends and family. But um, the other thing is we are happy to help. Um, if you are interested or want to do a section hike, think, you know what, I want to try this. What, what would be a good 10, 10 mile hike or 30 mile hike? We could literally 
get maps out and show you what to do. Um, or if you want to talk more about through hiking, we're happy to do that. Oh, this is our certificate uh, that we that we had done the whole hike uh, as a through hike. Not that you do it for these things, but they send them to you and you're kind of proud, you know, of the fact that you have that. Um, and then finally, the other thing we want to just kind of point out is that the ATC, I referenced it a few times in our talk, um, they really manage the trail. Um, and their, their work, their team of volunteers that come out and do trail maintenance, um, help reroute things when, you know, bridges have been washed out, um, pretty important. And the ATC has lots of information if you're interested in knowing more about through hiking or the Appalachian Trail. So we could have talked forever. <laughs> um, We've talked a whole well, hour. We talked a whole hour, but um, you know, we tried to pick different parts of the trail and give you an oversight of, of our experience. Um, and we're happy to answer questions or um, go over some other things um, if you would like. So let me undo this. How do I go back to the meeting? I think right here. Okay. And we're happy to take any questions you have. So oh, Shelly, it may help uh, us to see each other so yeah. we can see the people who want to ask a question. There you go. That's great. Okay. Yay. Like Judy Cuckoo's asking oh, the cost. The cost. So yeah, do you want to talk about cost? Oh, um, Hi, Judy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it, I guess we didn't do an exact breakdown uh, as far as equipment. By the time you go through uh all the stuff that you wear out all the shoes and yeah. gear probably about fifteen hundred dollars a piece for gear and then um on the trail itself you do duck into uh a hostel or cheap motel um i can't remember i was thinking that we were probably about ten thousand or even fifteen thousand between the two of us for the whole six months uh and you know we're a little older so we we would try to um you know we didn't skimp like the kids would i mean they could probably do it the, you know the 20 somethings they could probably do it uh, about five thousand yeah about five thousand and, and, and 10 or 15 was for two of us What about bugs? You know, honestly, we started so early and we did it because I didn't want to see snakes and I didn't want bugs. <laughs> so we really didn't hit bad bugs until Massachusetts just because of the timing, you know. Um, but we did not carry bug spray because it wasn't worth the wait. We just didn't see enough bugs. We did have those head nets. I think you saw a selfie with those. Um, and there were times that we were running through areas that were swampy with lots of bugs, but as long as they weren't in your face, you were okay. Did that boy you met on the Appalachian Trail uh, heading south, did he make it all the way from Alpena? Oh, the kid we ran into. Um, yes. oh, what was his name? Um, oh, oh. There was another, we were literally in Maine, and this kid recognized Eric from Alpena, that right. Eric had fixed his knee. And his mom owns the Coney Island. I can't think of his name right now. Yeah, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. But no, he got off. We've we've learned since he ended up getting off the trail. But I bet you this year. Yeah. Eric, uh, yeah, Eric, uh, you talked about a lot of rain in your first part of your trip. Mm -hmm. what, what would happen if the trail was going to get washed out because of the elevation change? Uh, you did create your own trail then around the washout sections? Oh, no, no they, they really don't want you. To, they want you to walk through the mud uh, because they're trying to protect. There's so much traffic. They're trying to protect the, the, the natural uh, flora. Um, but the, what, what these trail clubs do is if, if they get a section, usually it's going down a hill that's really getting washed out or you know constantly muddy. They'll they'll start to build like steps. They'll take 
you know, logs, you know, from fallen trees in the area. And then they, they'll, they'll, they'll try to build steps into it, which is really nice. Um, the, uh, yeah, basically you just kind of have to put up with walking through the water and the mud, but you're right. The water does get kind of funneled into the trail itself. There were times, with rocks in the mountains. Yeah, there were times, Bill, that we felt like we were walking in a river. The trail would literally be flowing with water yeah. as we were walking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. I saw somebody, yeah. You mentioned you had a couple of bears cross the trails. Mm -hmm. Okay, any any uh, 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 types or a, a sense maybe of a bear trying to attack or chase or anything? Oh, no, no. No, we were so early. You know, we started in February, you know, late February. So I think we really missed most right. of the bear activity. But like one, we were in Virginia, I think yeah. it was. And um, we'd gotten up like literally like five or six in the morning to, we'd camped on the top of the mountain, we're going down and you hear this rustling and there was a mother bear and three cubs going uphill. I, I guess they go down to the valleys to feed at night. And then they were working their way back uphill in the early morning, you know, and they were, you know, about a hundred foot away, but you know, yeah. they weren't interested in us or mm -hmm. you know, didn't have to worry about us. But we, you know, I'll tell you, we, we hung our food every oh, yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. We knew some kids that didn't, that, yeah. um, that slept with her food, which blew our mind, but we, no, we hung our food. Yeah. Very good. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I saw somebody message and asked if Eric broke his toe Oh, yeah. and he did. <laughs> And he doesn't have a good trail story. It was a, it was in a hotel. It was in a hotel, and I, I banged it against the chair like. <laughs> and the next day, we started out, and I I couldn't. I had to stop. It hurt, you know. And it and it's uh, like six weeks, you know. Every step, you kind of have to watch because it hurts, but you can do it, you know. Now, when I was practicing. I probably would have frowned if I had a patient that said they wanted to hike the trail uh, with a broken toe, but you can do it. <laughs> There's actually a little, a little saying on the trail, um, no rain, no pain, no mane. And so one of the things that I, I don't know that we said it, but we were in pain a lot of the trail, like your feet hurt yeah. so much. In fact, my big toes are still numb to this day from just the pounding of the trail. So you, there's constantly, you know, my knees, as we said earlier, he would have never told a patient to hike the Appalachian Trail with my knees. Um, so, you know, it's just part of life. You have to have that pain <laughs> to finish. But it's worth it. Oh, it's so good to see some faces. Hi, Patty. Yeah. Oh, you're um, blistered. Do you get any blisters when you're on the trail? No, um, so blisters. So oh. here's my advice. Um, we had two pairs of hiking shoes a piece that we had worn already practiced in. So when we started the trail, we had shoes we had already hiked, you know, hundred miles in, and then we had another pair waiting to be sent in. So we did not have any blisters until we're halfway through the trail, and we bought new shoes on the trail. And when we started, there were tons of people with blisters, but they were hiking in brand new shoes. So that was, that's the issue is if you hike in new shoes, you'll get blisters. I had listened to a presentation about the Pacific Coast Trail a couple of years ago. And the fellow was saying, you know, people out here are not wearing boots to hike this trail. We're, mm -hmm. we're wearing running shoes. Yeah. That's what's happening. And I wondered what your experience with that was. Mm -hmm. You see a well, lot yeah. of that. How does it work? Well, you know, I, I obviously haven't hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, but you know, knowing several people that have, it, apparently your strategies in preparing are a little different. You know, like in other words, in the east, you're getting a lot of rain, and so you need a tent. Uh, so you're putting your weight into the tent, or the weight that you carry, you're putting it into having a nice tent to protect you from the elements. Apparently out in the Pacific Crest Trail, it's dr very dry. So they, they would just carry like a real simple tarp, you know, they, they, you know, so they save weight there. But on the other side, they don't have the water. So that like we would always try to carry 
like a liter and a half to two liters of water uh, where they would carry like three or four liters. And, and, and I just did a blank. I think a liter is, uh, a or, pound? Uh, yeah, basically a, or no, isn't it 2.2 pounds, I think, you know, and, but, you know, so if you have two liters, you're up to like four and a half pounds, you know, and whereas, you know, if you're carrying four liters, you, you know, you're doubling that. Uh, and then, yeah, like you say, uh, we, we, we wore boots in the winter, you know, mainly because like you were saying more mud, you know, the snow, uh, by the middle of the trail, you could switch to, um, lighter, you know, low hiking shoes. And there, 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 some of these kids, these crazy 20 year olds, they, they would hike at sandals, you know, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'm 62, 63 now. And uh, it was nice to have real shoes. Yeah. I mean, the kids on the trail called us mom and dad, even though we're not parents. Um, you know, it was like the demographics were lots of 20 something year olds in between, high, you know, high school and college or college and jobs. We met a whole group of kids that we hiked with from Cornell University. And they would taken the semester off because you know, why, why do Zoom, you know, yeah. <laughs> pay that much money? Um, and then the other group tended to be newly retirees, only a handful of 30 or 40 something year olds. It tended to be 50 or 60, lots of military, lots of uh, retired teachers, police, fire. Yeah, it was interesting, you know, mix of people. Okay, I wonder if there's uh, one or two last questions yeah. before we uh, close up. Yeah, I, 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 saw, I saw you showing uh, Eric on your front yard there, and I know you lost a lot of weight and a lot of muscle when you were talking about you know, gained muscle on one and lost the other. How long did it take you to recover back to normal after you return on the trip? Uh, did you want to study on that? Or? <laughs> oh, well, um, I, I, I think I heard the question. I, I lost like 28 pounds. I think, Shelly, you lost 40. 30. Almost 40. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's basically yeah you're getting down to a real lean muscle mass uh when you get home you know you, you, you unfortunately you keep eating the way you did in the trail and you're gaining it back in about three or four months yeah. so we're right now five and a half months off the trail or six months so we're off the right. trail as long as we're on the trail and i've gained back about 25 pounds but as i said my feet still bother me um, the articles I've read is that it takes like a year for your body to really recover from the trail. I've been doing more yoga, trying to stretch. He's been having some back issues that he never had before. We don't know if that's related to the trail. It's hard to say. Um, we're also aging, you know. <laughs> um, I, did, I did see a question from Judy Cooper about ticks. Um, you know, we... There were ticks. Um, we both had ticks in bed in us, um, but thankfully we're okay. But we did know through hikers who did get Lyme disease yeah. on the trail. But but to put it in context, uh, there was an article. Uh, it was uh, by the National Park Service and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, mm -hmm. and they they literally took a sheet and went along the trail and then around the shelters and in the shelters. Um, to see how many ticks they were finding, where they were. And they, they, they aren't around the shelters or in the campsites around the shelter. They're more in the more remote sections of the trio, like especially if there's grass and stuff on the edges. And um, they didn't, and it's sort of like what you see here in Michigan, you didn't see, in the study, they didn't see ticks until like May, mm -hmm. and then by mid-July, late July, they, they seem to be gone. Uh, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is only about, it, it's a big number, but only about 25, 30% of the ticks actually carry the Lyme disease. And so if you do the tick checks and you're real meticulous about it and get them off quickly, because they take like, I think it's 48 hours before they can really, um, you know, embed, embed and, and, and actually transmit the disease. Um, you know, that said, you know, if you, you know, get symptoms, you know, probably should go get checked. And, and what it seemed like is if anybody went into a medical um, 
um, urgent care with any symptoms suggestive, they just automatically put them on a 10 day course. I think it was of doxycycline. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's common enough or necessary to carry the doxycycline, some did, but right? some people did. Some yeah. People did. yeah, good question. Um, as you There's can see, because, Eric, thank you very much. Yeah, we could talk all day. <laughs> um, I do, can I just say two more things? Um, right. One is Mark and Linda Stender, I, I, they're a local mm -hmm. couple as well. They wrote a book, um, they did a uh, what, uh, 100 or 1,000 miles on the trail. Um, and we met with them numerous oh, yeah. times prior to leaving as well. Um, so they're a great resource. Um, and I know they'd be happy to talk to anyone if anyone wants more information. I do also have a video, but it's, um, you know, cause we've been online for so long, it's a 20 minute video. What I'll do is I'll email it to Judy and it, she'll send it out to everyone. If anyone wants to see, it's a compilation of pictures of the trail and videos of the trail. If you would like to see that, I think Judy can email that to everyone and you can watch it at your leisure if you wanna know more. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah. For very informative program. And everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.